iteration that we've done. Um, uh, fourth? fourth? Yeah. Is it just? OK. Yeah. We haven't done one every semester. The fourth. Fourth iteration of um, this workshop um, has been well received in the past. So two hour workshop going through the nuts and bolts of case interviewing. Mihir is one of our adjunct um, faculty members here, teaches a very popular class in arts and communication, um, and definitely something that um, we recommend that you take if, um, if you have the opportunity to do so. Uh, has been teaching that class prior to that, um, has had consulting experience with McKinsey and Bain, um, and prior to that also was a, a deputy country director at, at um, the Clinton Foundation um, in um, Mumbai, mm -hmm. Delhi? In Delhi. In Delhi. Um, He's been doing this case review prep, these workshops um, for some years now, and actually does also individual case interview prep with students. So if you do have a, um, an actual scheduled case interview, please contact me, and we can make sure that you connect with me here and actually can do um, some one-on-one -on -one case interview prep. We'll um, have a videotape of today's session and send the link out to people. There's a sign-in sheet going around, so please make sure to sign that in so we can make sure to send it to you. Um, if you're not, if you can register for it, just make sure that you legibly include your information there. Um, so we're happy to have me here come and present to us, and um, please help me in welcoming it. Thank you, as always, Christy. OK, so let's get a gauge of who's in the audience here. So how many current Fletcher malls? OK. How many uh, MIBs here? Oh, wow, there's more MIBs. Uh, almost as many MIBs as, as malls. And then we have some Tufts college students too, right? One, two, three, four. OK. Anyone else that I've missed? Uh, not in any of the, uh, the categories here? No? OK, great. Yeah, I first asked, did this consulting workshop uh, what, a decade and a half ago. And then there was a break while I got into a, a number of things and, and started doing this in the fall of 2012. So the slides I know fairly well. Um, I will say, though, that uh, while this is being recorded in kind of an amateur fashion, this is our class camera. You might miss some of the, the interactive parts in this camera. You may not hear some things well. So, so don't think this will be a substitute for your being here and participating. It'll just be something that you can have on the side. I'm hoping to get done in about an hour and 45 minutes, hour, hour and a half. If we can, then leave some time for questions. But uh, for those of you who are in the class, they probably, you probably know that uh, I do cold call and that philosophy continues here. So I'll, I'll leave it for volunteering here, but this is not a passive workshop, folks. This is something that slowly as you get comfortable, you, you need to participate. Okay? The goal is to cover life in consulting. Uh, we will touch on the fit interview too, which is a very essential part of uh, the process before you get a job. But the primary focus today will be on consulting case interviews. For those of you who are not planning to go into consulting, hopefully this will be a nice intellectual exercise. Okay. So these are some of the faces. I saw someone left already when I said I might cold call. <laughs> right. Fear not, though. This will be this will come. This will be demystified in just a bit. Uh, by the way, moving gifts are not best practice. I've said this in the class, but there is a website that Fletcher used till about two years ago called What Should a Bar Call Me, where a lot of life at Fletcher was explained through moving gifts. So, I stole freely from those uh, graphics, and you'll see them here. And I promise it'll get better. A through the session, but two is as you continue your practice on this. You know, there's interestingly there's an intuitive sense that. Consulting case studies are supposed to test your raw intellectual horsepower, right? Your ability to think in a linear logical manner on the spot. But ironically, it is a skill that can be sharpened significantly with practice. 
Now, if you're not in a traditional business school program and you're competing with the same, for the same jobs with master's degree students, I've told a few of you, Amar, a bunch of you who I met before, that you should go through at least 50 cases okay, before you step into an interview. If not, you're at a disadvantage just in terms of practice. And this is a skill that you can hone through practice. Okay. We'll go through some of the exercises. I have four cases here. Who attended this workshop last year? Oh, just Sukrit. OK. And you did too? OK. So just a caveat for you all. I thought about changing the cases just to make it new. But uh, at the end of the day, I've kept these four cases primarily because I feel they illustrate good parts of consulting. But hopefully, you'll find a few new insights in, in terms of the participation and so forth. And I've also updated some numbers. Otherwise, we'll go through the, the same cases that we went through last year. Okay. So with practice, right? I want you to firmly believe. Right, that you go through 50 cases, find someone to do it. Don't read through cases, but find someone and you play it out. You will get better. Okay. Here's the agenda. Five minutes on a few communication nuggets. I, I guess I'm biased. You know, I'm really close to the class right now. But I've drawn out just a few principles that I feel will apply to case study interviews too. 10 to 15 minutes on the fit interview. And I'll go through the five most commonly asked fit questions. I think, Bahar, some, some of you have been through that, but I'll go through that uh, quickly. And then we'll get into the case interview with some Q&A at the end. Okay. Now, class members will know this. I've asked this a number of times. I think there's a fundamental aspect of speaking, whether it's public speaking or interview speaking, that you need to know. right? And that is, what is the speed of human speech. If someone gives you an indication, okay, 30 seconds, just tell me a little bit, walk me through your resume, or tell me about your strengths. Right? What is the speed of speech? I'm going to ask you to guess. What is your name? Andy. Andy, okay. So you have a minute, 60 seconds. How many words do you think you will speak in 60 seconds? In 60 seconds, how many words? Um, probably close to 1,000. <laughs> we would like to hear you speak. Oh, okay, sure. What, uh, what am I talking about here? You can do it from there. Okay. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's do it for 10 seconds, okay? 10 seconds. And say as much as you want in 10 seconds. Okay. Starting now. Well, I got up this morning. I had some breakfast. It was wonderfully delicious. I had some eggs. I put some onions on there. I wanted to have some bacon. There was no bacon. That was slightly upsetting that I didn't have any bacon. Stop. Um, <laughs> now, you did speak a little faster than you would in an interview, yes. but how many words do you think you spoke? 30. That is the right answer, folks. 2.5 to 3 words a second. Now, you can't cheat this. You can't make this 5. If you make it 1, you're going to speak very, very slowly. 1 word a second. 2.5 to 3 across languages. As you may prepare some critical questions and you write them down, keep the speed of speech in mind. Okay. This is one of the nuggets of speech. The second thing is, remember, in interviews and in public speaking, there are three things that you want to hit off on. Logos, ethos, pathos. Logos, intuitive, is a logical appeal of your point, of your response. Ethos is the credibility that you bring in as a speaker. And you need to reinforce the credibility. And pathos is the emotional appeal. Okay. The end of the day, remember, the odds are stacked against you. you a typical firm will go through 60, 80, 100 candidates for maybe three or four jobs. Right? So you've got to do well on the case, but you also have to connect through your logical appeal, your appeal from credibility, and your emotional appeal. Okay, I'm just breezing through this. But see how you can connect to the interviewer. A lot of times people say, should I have a more serious style? Should I be informal? What kind of questions should I ask the interviewer when they say, what questions do you have for me at the end? And I say, there isn't a formula for that. You need to gauge right, the personality, the style of the interviewer, and you need to flow with the interview. The best way to do that is practice simulate these interviews with your classmates, with anyone you can find. Third and last nugget here before we go to the fitted interview is sound bites. Now, Sukrit, what's a sound bite? Sound bite is a phrase that essentially summarizes not your entire point, but uh, the, the 
paragraphs or a couple of sections of the argument that you were making, one line of phrase that summarizes it all and okay. can be taken out of context to explain your argument. Okay. You want like Julia, you want to compliment that? Now, a typical interviewer, when they come for a schedule here, right, you have a Fletcher schedule or you go to a business school, you know, you may have eight or nine interviews that day. And for you, that's the interview of a life, lifetime, right? But for them, this is actually a little bit of an off day. You know, they've, they've been in the middle of a case, they've come out, they've volunteered for recruiting, and they're going to go through eight or nine people, right, in half hour or one hour sections. They need to remember sound bites, self-contained words or phrases. You may not need them when you write, but when you speak, you need to have a sound bite that captures the essence of what you had just said. More so in cases than in everyday conversation, you have just gone through a portion of the case. At the end, you're giving a, an interim hypothesis. But it is your sound bite. Even when you're answering questions about your life, about your background, you can give a longer answer, but then there's a sound bite at the end that the interviewer can recall. A sound bite is typically used in media, where even if you speak with the president and he, or he speaks for two minutes, in 120 seconds, he will probably speak 350 words. And there'll only be a certain amount that can fit in on a television program. So you need these self-contained sentences that stand out and that capture the essence of what you had just said. Think about sound bites in your responses. Three things, speed of speech, logos, ethos, pathos, and sound bites for your interviews. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Now, consulting and the fit interview. Folks, when you go through this, you know, if, if the philosophy in life that I have is if you're not enjoying it, if you're not having fun, you're probably still not doing it right. Okay, and uh, there's so many variables here in terms of what an office needs, and just the numbers are, are so low that I think you have to approach it with a healthy perspective. It is this healthy perspective, and you're not mystifying the situation, that actually makes you more attractive to the consulting firm. Okay. Think about controlling the controllables, which is the time that you can spend on the cases. The outcome, the compatibility, you may not. I find that working with a lot of people, sometimes they go through an interview and they go through a final round, and there is feedback that perhaps you could have had more structure, okay? Or perhaps, you know, you could have been a little more creative in this aspect of the case. But quite honestly, I think it comes down to there were seven or eight great people in the final <coughs> round, and we could only fit two. So we're giving you a reason. Try not to take that personally. Don't think that you're not a creative person. Don't think that you hadn't gone through the, the problem in a, in a unique manner, doing as well as you can. Just approach it with a healthy perspective. Okay? And I'll say that your competition, folks, is not in this room. It's not in this room. Okay? There's no quota for Fletcher. I think the competition is more with MBA students around. Okay? So use the resources you make teams. Right? Find your team. When you make a specific team of three or four people and you help someone, then it works, the structure works for them to sit with you and help you. And you need those eyes. It's not the same as reading a Cosentino book and then even looking at a mirror. You need those eyes in front of you to simulate the case. Try and simulate it. The realistic expectations, try and stay calm and relaxed. Whatever it takes for you to be as close to your 100% relaxed potential is what you need to be in the case. That's when your mind opens up, right? That's when time slows down and you can process more in real time. Okay, so want this, but don't want it too badly. Okay. So what is consulting? Let's have some words. Words for consulting. Sure. Uh, it's um, managing business problems. Problems, Problem. okay? Problem solving, okay? Mm -hmm. Consulting is about problem solving. Bingo, it's family feud, first answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah? yeah? Um, Mina, right? Yeah. Mina, Mina. Identifying weaknesses. Weaknesses in whom? In an organization, in a particular okay. model, plan, can be anything. Okay. Whatever they come to you for. 
Okay, so fixing problems for organizations, right? Yeah. What else? What else comes to mind? Words that come to mind. What's your name? Uh, Andy. Andy, yeah. Training. Training. Who are you training? Uh, whoever needs to be trained. Management or okay. a specific aspect of an organization, a specific branch of an organization. Yeah, I mean, the, I think the word for it is consulting because training implies like a kind of a top-down thing. So that's, that's what it is. Okay, so there's some element of educating, consulting. Yeah? Um, identifying with the client. Okay, client, right? This is word client always first, client first. You hear this all the time. Client, yeah? Yeah, providing outside expertise. Okay, so objective outside expertise, yeah? Team. Okay. One more, and then we'll see what's on the list at the back. Um, just to add on client servicing. Client, yeah. Client yeah. servicing. Excellent. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Maya. Sorry? Maya. Maya. Yeah. Uh, adding the value. Adding the value. Adding value, right? Let's see which of these words are, are up here. Performance improvement, okay? One is solving a problem, but two is enhancing performance. Client. Right. A lot of you said that there is a client, it's a finite time with someone external that you have. Okay. Projects, studies, cases. So just within three strategy firms, McKinsey, Bain, and BCG, they call the same thing three different words. Right. Projects, studies, cases. Short-term nature, where you work with a team for a client. Solve a problem or improve performance, team. Number few said that. Right. Frameworks, decks. Now you didn't say this. Mm -hmm. Folks, you're gonna swim in this. You're gonna swim in this. Excel and Dex. PowerPoint is going to be your best friend for the first couple of years. Those moments when you are changing the destiny of an organization by having a conversation with the CEO are gonna be far and few between. You gotta earn your stripes. And even when you do, those moments are what's marketed, but keep in mind you've got to like you've got to like the work for what it is on a day-to-day -day basis because otherwise you're not going to be happy. Okay. PowerPoint decks. You don't need to worry about having the skills right now, but you need to know that that is how you're going to add value. Deliverables and deadlines. You didn't say this, right? Deliverable. You got to deliver something by a certain time. Okay and travel. You can get lucky here, and I think it's not clear, I think the first couple of years whether travel, at least to me, is good or bad. Right? It's, it's great getting to see another place on an expense account. You get the same type of room as a partner gets. Right? You, you, know, you get your meals free, you get to be out there, get more impact when you're with the client. Some of the strategic cases that are in, in the home office are, are Convenient, because you can sleep on your bed and have a little more time, but then they're more like external. Okay? For those with families, of course, travel can be taxing. But keep in mind that firms are very aware of they don't want you to burn out too, so to the extent that you can, there's been more of a trend towards getting clients close to your office so that you don't have to necessarily go to another part of the country when there's an office there. Okay? And one more. Anyone's got a, the bingo question here? One more. Yeah? Communication. Jin Yun? Communication, yeah, actually that's, that's a good point. That should be there, but it's there in, in all aspects here, right? Pressure up or out. They may not say it, but that it's there, right? There's a pyramid structure here. And I think it's a, two years is a good time anyways for you to assess. I would say that there are as many, if not more people who choose to leave after a couple of years versus those that are counseled out, but that is the structure. And it's not, an, it's not a function of your capabilities as much as your fit with this style of work and life. Okay. I don't necessarily want to play and paint a gloomy picture. I, I chose to be in the field. I think there's some great learning, but I want to paint a realistic picture as you approach this. Okay. Uh, I think I'm slightly biased to feeling that at a school like this, if you've, you, know, you had your heart in helping, serving the underserved around the world, you should do this. But I also believe that there is value in getting the skill set and then being able to, to make that change, which I think inevitably most of you are thinking of. But if it doesn't work out, there's tons of jobs out there. 
I mean, Christy talked about my background a little bit. I've been much more of a journeyman than a destination person, but I think I've had seven or eight jobs, and they've all, they've all been fulfilling in their own way. They've all had trade-offs, and I can't say one was better than the other. Okay. So, Chris? On the fourth point, you said projects, studies, and cases, the different, in the big three different, call them different things. Can you tell me which one calls them what? Okay, well, McKinsey basically calls it a study. Bain used to call it a project, right? And BCG has, has moved around a little bit, but it used to call it, at least at, when I was there, it was calling it a, a case, okay? But then there's also within other firms, there's, there's differences, okay? Okay, so two parts, fit interview, case interview. Let's do fit first. Right. Top five fit questions. Some of you have heard this before, but those that you have not, there's been, actually, at least when I was there, there was a little bit of a focus group that said, what are the categories of questions that we want to cover when we're trying to get to know someone? Right? And that should encompass quite a, few, quite a few things about their background. And I've seen this tested over and over again. I get students saying, I went to an interview, and this is exactly what they covered when we did the fit portion. What is the first thing that you will walk into an interview that the interviewer will want to know about. About. Yourself. Yourself. Interestingly, no. The fact that you are there. Why you want to work there. It is why us. You will see this. The first thing you step into an interview, 80 to 90% of the time, you will sit and they say, so tell me, why do you want to do consulting? Why Deloitte? Why San Francisco? Okay. Why social change? Why us? Sometimes rotorical answer, right? Well, oh. well, you're Goldman Sachs, you're McKinsey, you know? But no, that won't suffice. Right. Why us? What's the opposite of why us? Yeah, why not us is also the opposite of why us. But I think what they look for is why you. <laughs> you know, and every time I do this, I do get someone who says this, why not us? <laughs> yeah. It's very fair. I know, I know to expect this answer. Why you? Walk me through your resume. Okay. Tell me about your professional highlights. It gives you an opportunity to highlight what you have on that resume in a couple of minutes. Why you? Whatever you have on your resume, folks, think about ways you can express, say more about it. If there is a paragraph on there, you should be able to expand. You should be able to bring it to life with logos, ethos, and pathos. Okay. Two years ago, you spent a year at the Gates Foundation. You spent six months at the Gates Foundation. Interestingly, you work in public health. Why did you make this decision? What did you learn? It's there, it's fair game. You should be able to bring it to life. You should light up when you have an opportunity to talk about this. It's been your life. Sometimes you may have made a bad decision or if it hasn't worked out well, but there's still a way that you can communicate it. I will tell you that honesty in the interview, in the case, it's almost never hurts you. It is refreshing to see someone who's being honest about their weaknesses. Clearly the fact that you're in the interview room is you've been called and you've been selected. If you can be honest, reveal things where you made mistakes and learn, it actually helps you stand out. I don't manufacture it, but when that comes, it will help. Okay. Why you? The third question is, has two sides. Tell me about your X and Y. Strengths and weaknesses. For some people, it's harder to, to, reveal, to talk about their strengths and then it is to talk about your weaknesses. How many of you have thought about this question? Let me see those hands. How many of you are ready to respond to that question today and in this setting? Okay, good. good. I'm not gonna ask you, but that's good. Okay. My hope is that these five categories of questions, someone should be able to wake you up in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. and you should still be able to answer enthusiastically. 
Now the thing with strengths and weaknesses, if you haven't necessarily thought about it, right? I mean, if I was to say, Constantine, you know, tell me your top three strengths, and I put you on a spot in the situation which would be similar to what an interview would be like, you'd probably respond by saying something like, oh, um, yeah, well, I, I, hmm. well, okay, so yeah, one is, I think I'm good with data and kind of analytics, right? Data analytics, okay, so that's one. Gosh, what's the second one? <laughs> well, you know, I think I've worked with teams before and yeah, I think that has worked out well for me. And the third one, third one, third one, can I take a second now? Okay, the third one is, yes, I've got it. No, actually, I think I have a good, yeah, I have a sense of humor. And I think that it kind of lightens the mood, okay? That will be his response. Now I'll do something else, go through a case study and come back to Constantine 20 minutes later. And I say, Constantine, what's your top three strengths? And he will say, oh, okay, well, yeah, one is I worked, um, I worked with data in the past, so I'd say data analytics. Two is uh, I think I've had a couple of opportunities to both, uh, yeah, I guess I worked with and led a team this time. And three is, yeah, my, you know, just my personality, a sense of humor, I think it helps. It helps me, it helps the client. I'll do something else. I'll come back 20 minutes later to Constantine and say, Constantine, tell me your top three strengths. And he'll say, data analytics, working with teams, and at times just my ability to not take things seriously. Example one, example two, example three. Now what has happened in that time? Only thing is practice. Right. Now you don't have to be robotic about it, like one, two, three, I mean, but there will be this kind of practice will help. And my, my submission to you is why make the interview the practice? Make sure this is down, write it out, you're ready. Give me an example of a time when, don't tell me you're a good leader, but when you had an opportunity to lead a group, when you faced an ethical dis dilemma, okay. when you were forced to work with a teammate who didn't think the way you did. Give me an example of a time, write 10 of these down. Something that's happened where if you just come out of college, that's fine, find a time. <laughs> Bless you. Thank and, you. Yeah, and then write it out so that you know this. Oops. For those of you that didn't see number five, what's the last thing that you will always be asked when you leave an interview? Last thing you're always asked, yes? Do you have any questions? Exactly. Do you have any questions for me? Anything else I can answer? That's the last impression. Right. Any questions I can answer? What should you ask that person? You can't have a canned question here because it'll depend on the conversation. My submission is make sure that you Think about something that the person can, he or she can specifically answer. If it's a generic question, that can be found on a website or tell me about what the firm has planned, you know, five years from now. I think it's okay, but it, it won't stimulate the person because they're testing how you were a good problem solver, how you're creative, how you can ask good questions. And there should be something that makes the person think. Gauge it out if the person has talked a lot about their personal life and like, you know, life balance. And I think you can ask how they balance their, you know, their, how they find the balance here. But if they're not, figure out what the pulse of the person is. For that, you need to be well slept and you need to not take this process that seriously. Then you can think, you can connect with the person. This is not Mr. Bain that's coming out. This is someone like, like you who is there just five years ago in school who's coming back or 10 years ago who's coming back to get to know you too. Yeah? From your experience, could you speak about a few real weaknesses that you might have heard about from a candidate that you felt really helped the candidate's uh, you know, application or the interview? Yeah, so what are people, actually I did cover this, so thanks, I'm reasonable. What are two things that you're looking for when you ask this question to someone? What are your weaknesses? What are you looking for? Right. I, I think you'd look, be looking for honesty. Honesty is one. Thank you. And, and also how you have faced uh, those problems and how you've uh, worked with them over time. Yep. I think right, there's the same thing. How, you, how you're improving, working on improving. Okay. 
Okay, so honesty, yeah, and then there's implied, like when you say weakness, you, you know, you identify it, so you're going to work, be working towards it. Self-awareness. Exactly, thank you. Introspection, are you an introspective person? Are you a self-aware person? So I will tell you that one weakness I don't like to hear, or people don't like to hear, is my weakness is my impatience for teammates who are not as competent as I am. Okay. Anything that's a disguised strength it is very obvious, really. It's, it's so obvious, so don't do that. Don't think about how you can give a disguised strength as a weakness. Okay. So many things. I mean, people have said, in fact, someone has said that things I look for, I'm not very good at structure, right? And I find that problem solving in a short amount of time can be difficult. Now, these, you think that these two are fundamentally wrong things to state, but how you define these, right? How you explain them, even these can be your true weaknesses. You know, like not being, as there's so many, you know, like not being able to step out of a situation fast enough. But I'm hoping that this is what I will get a chance to, to sharpen, to work on. <coughs> I mean, you know, that the fact that I'm looking to work in this country, but I haven't really experienced it before. Right? There's, I mean, if you go through this, there's so many that you can share. Yeah, I mean, this comes, I mean, clearly there's, there's many things about yourself that you don't want to share in that setting. But I think if you go through this, if you spend, let's say you spend an hour on each of these questions, right, come up with that list, and then you'll know, you'll know yourself, just things that I just, I mean, you don't really have to list, you know, open your, your closet and, and list everything out, right? But those that, that you feel are borderline, test them with people. Like literally find a team, find it after the session, find three or four people, you know, even if you don't know them, say, just sit, I need the pair of eyes, I need you to tell me, give me feedback. Yeah, Mina? Uh, as an interviewer, is self-introspection such a big deal? Self-awareness? I mean, I understand yeah. that you have to be, you have to be a nice person, you have to get along with people, you have to be, you have to fit into the culture of the organization. But why is self-awareness such an important Well, you know, anything that you can cross off is, is helpful. I mean, you're looking at a, a candidate that's complete in so many respects, right? So the fact that they're asking you such a question is they want to seek if you can be honest, right? And of course, if you're the maturity and self-awareness are typically correlated. Okay, they want to make sure that you're client ready. But is self-awareness something bad? Oh, it's good. I'm saying it's good. Oh, it's good. Okay. I'm saying this by, by this you're showing that you're aware. Oh, okay. Okay. One more. Yeah, so I think a part, like how you elaborate on a strength or a weakness typically is the fact that you identified it. The first step to a weakness is identifying it, right? And so it's almost implied, but if you talk about how you, if you have a concrete example of how you've been working towards it or how you plan to work on, on this weakness, it's, ob it's helpful because listing it only takes a couple of seconds. You typically have several more seconds to go through it. So all this, uh, I can go through also in more detail after the session. I'll, I'll wait uh, longer if you have some specifics. But let's get to uh, the main part that you, most of you came for now, the case interview. Okay. The case interview is a snapshot of a consulting assignment. So in some ways, you know, it, it's so different from an actual assignment when you have a problem. Right? Because then you can go back, you can research, you can brainstorm. You have several days before you come up with a hypothesis. But here you've got to come up with something in real time and in a short amount of time. Right? But you still want to s simulate the language, the thinking that you would do in an extended case. It is a simulation of a communication. Okay? What you say and how you say is important here. Interviewer provides some background, you go through, you ask questions. Interviewer will try and keep you on track because you typically run out of time before you can solve a complex case. So they'll, they'll give you hints on where they want you to focus. And then you put together a linear logical approach to solving the problem. 10 to 30 minutes, I think there are times when one case can go over, but typically most cases are between this time. It won't be shorter than that, okay? And it won't be much longer than 30 minutes for a case. 
but you can do it. YK Center viewers, snapshot reaction, and it's supposed to cover often a number of these skills. Okay. Many of the forms that the interviewers have have some kind of rating, you know, on creativity, problem solving, right, organizational ability. So if you're using a piece of paper, right, it is important that you try and structure it as best as you can. They may not take the paper with you, but they are observing because how you organize your ideas is also important. Okay. Try not to break it down this way to see if you're checking off on all of these points. But in a good case study, you should be able to, to feel something about the person in all these areas. Go through this quickly. The first approach is to clarify. Please make sure you understand and that you have heard what the case interviewer has asked you. A lot of people feel shy at the beginning and they'll write something down and they'll feel that it's an obvious question to, to repeat. But even if you are repeating, just to make sure that you understood exactly a, you heard what the interviewer has asked you, and two, you understood what the problem is. Let's try and underline, bold the actual problem that you're supposed to be solving at each stage. And then right away, it's completely fine to say, can I take a minute or a few seconds to gather my thoughts? Even if you feel you want to jump into it, try and at least have a little bit of silence. I think silence, thinking, and then speaking is never a bad thing. A lot of times people are afraid of silence. Right? If I don't say anything, do I have to fill the next few seconds up? Take your time. You can tell when someone's thinking. But come up with an early structure. You will be judged by that. You know, a lot of GMATs, the first, first responses impact your ability in these standardized tests to, to score high. And this is the first time you're putting a structure down. Take your time. A little later in the case, you can go with your gut. Analyze, that's the main part where you actually go through the information, analyze it, and then have a conclusion. I will also say have what I called interim hypotheses. Given this analysis, given where we are right now, my sense is that the client should think about X and Y. Or this analysis reveals that there is a 4% increase in Y. If you can say this, this really is one quick differentiator, which most people don't do. Interim hypothesis, write it down, interim recommendations. It doesn't have to be an answer at the end of the case. Clarify, structure, analyze, conclude, and then you'll give them what they want. Through this, it is important and it will show, okay, if you go through the same motion, it will show whether you are relaxed and enjoying this process or not. I will say for me, personally, in one of the, the most difficult consulting jobs, which was with the San Francisco office of Boston Consulting Group, actually for an internship, I know something came over, I said that, you know, I see a lot of people there, I was the only one from my business school that was there, and I just said, you know, I'm just happy to be here. And I, I don't know, I just made myself more happy. Now, I, somehow I didn't fake it, but I was just happy. When I met someone, I was, happy and they actually said that at the end that's what was the differentiate you seemed relaxed okay. and I don't think I was the best case solver but if you can manage and just demystify and enjoy smile they also said specifically you smiled you know a lot more can't be fake right but at the right time doing the same thing doing it relaxed manner See, the thing is, firms want people, it's like even relationships, when you don't want it too bad is when they want you. Right? You can't, the moment you want it too bad, it shows. And it generally never works. As well as not wanting it too bad. Wanting it, but not too bad. Six case categories, there's, you could say there's, there's more, but I'm gonna lay these out. Profit, profitability, market sizing, industry analysis, investment operations, and oddballs. And we're going to go through four or so, four, in fact, five of these categories. Okay. Profits. Very common case. Client is experiencing declining profitability. Here's some examples. By the way, you're going to get a PDF of this file. 
okay, at the end, so you don't need to take a lot of notes. Just want you to focus, read what's up there. We're not solving these cases, but these are examples of sample <coughs> questions. Now we start with the profitability case, right? What is the first structure that you need to think about most of the time? What is profit? What is the equation for profit? Okay. Sales or revenues minus cost. Now on your sheet of paper, if you can lay this out, it's very obvious to you, right? But the moment you have revenues and costs, it shows a basic level of structure. What's the next level? What is the formula for revenues? No, it's not. You said sales times? So, so this even, you know, the thing is sometimes the labels, right, which you're thinking, you're thinking the word sales and the actual term is quantity. Refine this. Go to Wikipedia if you've not taken a course. Just go through a typical, maybe you could read up on finance 101, marketing, 4Ps, revenues. But it's price times quantity. And sales tends to be a, a synonym for the word revenue. So revenue uh, would be price times quantity, costs. How can you break costs down in a large organization typically? Fixed and variable, okay? Price times quantity minus fixed costs, variable costs. What is a fixed cost? A piece of land that you have to maybe pay on every month to keep or a shop okay. inside a mall that you have to pay on every month whether you sell it or not. We hear more perspectives. Bahar, how would you define fixed costs? That's, that's an example of a fixed cost. Yeah, just um, something that's going to remain consistent. Louder? Something? Consistent. What do you mean by consistent? <coughs> yeah. Uh, now, I would say, if, like, you feel like you want to dive into a case, but often you will get a question on your understanding of the concept. And like I know you know what fixed costs are, but when you say consistent, you've used that word, right? That's one of the, I wouldn't say sound bites, but it's a word that you've used. We want to understand what you mean by consistent. When we say it's unchanged, what do you mean that it's unchanged, okay? A fixed cost is typically a cost that does not vary with an incremental quantity sold. So you can break it down. Right, by incremental quantity. So, so example is electricity, which you can't break down accounting-wise. You, uh, you could allocate units, but you can't directly break it down. Or land, which is fixed. And a variable cost is something that you can directly attribute to each product So, So the actual, if you're selling ice cream, the actual cone and the ice cream that goes in there. Go through this, there's fixed labor and then there's variable labor. Fixed labor could be SGNA management. You can't really break it down. You probably still need a CFO whether you sell four units or 20 units. Right? And then there's specific labor that is variable at, at the machine floor. Now, if you don't, even if you're not an MBA, the fact that you're coming into consulting, you are expected to know concepts at this level. And if you've not taken a course, make sure you go to Wikipedia or wherever else so that you have a sense of understanding this. Four revenues for price quantity. In terms of increasing revenues, there's a few frameworks. Now, I won't have time to explain most frameworks here, but I will tell you the names so you can go and look them up. Okay. Typically, when you're trying to, to, to figure out what to do with a product, there are four Ps of marketing, price, placement, promotion, and product. There's four Cs, there's five forces. There's actually some more frameworks here. I'm gonna, these are five frameworks that just go and read up a little bit on them if you've not encountered them, okay? Porter's five forces is a way to analyze getting into a new industry, okay? There is competition, the power of suppliers, substitutes, buyers, and new entrants. Yeah, again, don't have time to, to explain all of this here, but I think if you do some reading, if you spend a half hour with this, you'll get a sense for the framework. Four Ps of marketing, a SWOT analysis, again, in terms of thinking about selling a, a division or getting into a space, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, or threats. McKinsey's S, 7S model, in terms of understanding your organizational structure and systems, whether it's healthy. 
Now, when, if you do decide to use these frameworks, don't say I'm going to use McKinsey's 7S model, okay? but keep that at the back of your mind. Okay? And the BCG matrix in terms of investment, like basically, which has a couple of axes here in terms of market growth rate and the relative market share on the y-axis. Any of these after class, if you want some, you just want to discuss a little more, or if you'd like pointers on where to read up on them, I'll be around, but I'm just going to leave these out for you. Yeah. So let's get into a real case and do it interactively. Okay, get ready. I might cold call you, so I want you to make sure you you're there with the case. A market sizing case. How many stamps are used every year in the U.S. Right? How many manhole covers are there? How many massages are given in the Midwest? How many people play tennis at the Fletcher Tennis Courts in the last year? Let's do a first market sizing case. <laughs> if you're given a case like this, maintain your cool, use a framework, and think your logic out loud. Don't keep it here. Think your logic out loud, and know some basic facts. You'll have this sheet there, but you may update it a little bit. The average income has, has moved. But just even little facts here. I think if you have this much, you're fine. The population is, is a little more than 320 million now. Yeah. We'll come off sharp if you know this. Okay. Question to you is how many car tires are there in the US right now? Let's say the time period is, is the current one. How many car tires are there in the US? How would you like to think about this case? What's your name? Doris. Doris, yeah. Good. So already some nuances. People, drivers, households. Okay. How many households or how many people or what would you pick? Would you pick households or would you pick number of people? I think I'd do households. Households. Okay. One second. Yeah. Okay. Amar, taking that, what would you say? What would you say in the first few seconds? Give me. Give me your statements. Yeah. Um, so I start by saying. Okay, the way I want to think about this mm -hmm. is uh, by splitting the population into households uh -huh. uh, and assessing uh, the number of tires through um, the number of tires households <coughs> own, uh, and then also adding that to the additional inventory that exists in the market outside of the ones that are on the market. Uh -huh, okay. So hold on just there. He said, like, okay, I'm give a statement. I'm going to take the number of households, estimate how many cars they own, then then through that, how many tires you could have specified that, right? But then you also said something that's the word inventory. Because this question is how many car tires are there in the US? Not being used or being run. Okay. Extra points for that. So taking this logic, Meena, yeah? Um, Give some numbers. Sorry, can I just add to, the, uh, to what I was said? How about commercial use? We're not just thinking about people who are driving their own cars. Okay. There are firms which own cars, mm -hmm. aeroplanes which have tires on them. No, but this is car tires. Okay, sorry. So, I mean, so there are commercially used cars and commercially used Excellent. Excellent. So, the first level, it seems good enough, households times cars times tires. <laughs> but wait, there's inventory and there's commercial uses. Okay. Who would like to put some numbers? I don't know if Andy? this is right, I'll yeah. just throw it out there. So, of your slide, if I remember correctly, it was 120 million households. Which slides? Okay, slide on the last one, yeah. 120 million households. 120 million households. Each household in the U.S., I believe, owns one and a half cars. So, I'm going to go 120 times 1.5. Uh, okay, so what if I tell you it's one car per household? And then Take that. Four for tires. Sorry. Great. Times Anything, yeah, that you feel that you can add here? Yes? Yeah. 
So within that first part of the equation, which seems simple, yeah, four tires on a car, but wait, five tires per car. Okay, so it's 120 million times five. Okay, yeah? Yeah, it's, so I gave you the fact that it's typically in the U.S. there's one car per household. Okay. On average, some households may have two or three, some may not have any, but the average is one. So if you were thinking about this, right, how about this as one way to break it down? The number of tires on cars versus not on cars, because then it allows you to, to have a tree that will be mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. Yeah, this is a, a common buzzword. Me, yeah, it's called MISI. Mutually exclusive but collectively exhaustive. Okay. So on cars, okay, besides five tires per car, I just threw something out. There can be a few other branches. You mentioned inventory. What's, what's, what should be the, a good next branch? No, I, I was actually thinking that instead of looking at it from a household perspective, why don't we look at it from a manufacturing perspective? You could, you could, but uh, then you won't account for inventory that's been lying around for a while, right? And not everything needs to be sold. Like people have owned cars over many years. Right? Your, your question is how many car tires are there in the U.S.? If I look at the manufacturing economy, I find out what percentage of the manufacturing is producing car tires, and they will all obviously have their inventory numbers, then I will exactly get the, I mean, I don't really need to look at a subset of my market. I look at where the market is stemming from, right? Well, you can look at it from two sides, but I think it's simpler, right, that to say that manufacture, say there were one million tires manufactured last year. I mean, the industry could be growing or, you know, it could be declining, and you assume a certain percentage. Versus you know that there are that many households and they have cars and these are really running, right? So it is possible. It's not, it's not a illogical way to go about it, but then you have to have your intuition in terms of what's a simpler way or what's a more common way of doing it. If you went down that path, I think it would be trickier, but you can, you can do it, you know, and then you'll see if it's collectively exhausted, right? But I think saying that I'd like to do it one way, but there is another way and that we could propose to do it adds richness to your analysis. Okay. okay. Jinhyun? I like to think of things in three so for on cars and I try and say things that are already in households and the second uh, rental is very common and the third is called cars that are not sold. Okay. So sold and unsold, another branch. Right? And then you said rental fleet. Rental fleet is actually small relative to households, but would you say that that's commercial? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, so let's branch everything, okay? Let's take a look at this numbers, okay? Private, unsold, and public. So if you use the word private, <coughs> then you can use public. You use, or you can use commercial, right? Now, interestingly, this number is 600 million, right? 120 million households times number of cars, which is one times car tires per car. If you had left your analysis there, which is what the majority of people will primarily only cover in the first round. That number is 600 million, but unsold, right? Unsold, inventory, manufacturer, unsold, household, not bought yet, 10%. And these numbers they might give you. Now, the number for government cars, right, is quite large. Right, there's federal government, state government, and local government. They own a lot of vehicles. You may not know this, but I think if you list it, then you can get these numbers. Right? And there's fleets. So rentals, but could it, what else could be clubbed with? Taxis, right? You can call it a fleet. So it's a more, it's a higher level term. Because otherwise your sheet will, you know, will be a little messy. Okay. So here you have what, 700, 810 million car tires. Now, what did we say before? We said on cars and not on cars. What is your guess for how many tires are not on cars? How would you start thinking about this? Where would these tires be? At the back, and please speak loudly so we can hear you. So we start with uh, probably mapping out the number of truck companies that we have, moving companies. Mm -hmm. Why do you say moving companies? Um, again, maybe highly a lot of trucks which are not essentially 
The question is around car tires. Sorry? Car tires, not trucks. But aren't we moving on to the not on car section? Right, but not not on trucks. Okay. Yeah? So I have a question. Huh? What's the difference between unsold cars and uh, car tires and tires which are not on cars? Cars which are not sold and then tires which are not sold. So the tires are already on cars, but the cars haven't been bought. OK, come back, yeah? Yep, exactly. But what do you think that number is? And how would you find that number? Half of the current uh, cars and operations. Okay, anyone have a, has a guess to that? Yeah? I would say, because we have the number is 810 million. Probably replace the car what, every seven or eight years, which means there has to be a certain amount of inventory um, in place to go onto those cars that are being produced. Okay. And what else would be not on cars besides this inventory? Where would the other tires be? What happens to tires? Tire companies that manufacture just tires and not cars, like uh, Goodyear, for example. Would be it's inventory, cars. right? Inventory that's not on cars. Let's see what this answer has. So at manufacturers, which you've been talking about, <laughs> and in shops. But the number of tires in dumps and alternate use is 500 million. Now again, something that you may not know or think about. Basically, as many as you would have got in the household calculation. Okay. This number you may not be able to come up with, but say this 50 million could be a function of percentage of the, the tires that are on cars that are sold. Whether your number is 1.36 billion or whether, hold on one say whether it's 1.1 or if it's 700 million, that's still okay. But if you got anywhere near this structure, you have aced this case. Okay? This is also a stretch solution. Don't think that you need to go in every case and be able to solve it at this level. But when you kind of, when you've gone through a case at one level and you feel you've gotten along in solving it, there's a lot of richness. And if you can hold yourself back and keep thinking, keep thinking, keep thinking, refining your words, then you'll get close to this. What was your question? You may say they're also going to be they're going to be private, unsold, and public. And just by virtue of saying mentioning unsold, they may give you the figure ten percent, which helps you get an actual mm -hmm. figure. Mm -hmm. But in the event that they don't provide you with that information, is it recommended that you create uh, that you use your intuition to come up with the best guess? Mm -hmm. or simply say that the six hundred figure, which I was able to calculate, is an underestimate due to the fact that we have absolutely. That's exactly what I'm implying. You may not have come to whether it was ten percent or twenty percent. If you can, if you said eighty percent, you know that that implies something's off in, in your logic. If you said ten, twenty, or twenty-five, or five, it would still be fine. The only thing is then you're supposed, if you give out a number, then you're supposed to calculate it too. There is value in spending a few hours just on math. You know, what is 16 times 4,000? Or what is 12 times 5 times whatever? Just give yourself this and see if you can remember some of the mental math calculations. It is rare for you to have a calculator. And it's just, it's just not the style. Some cases involve a lot of calculations, but they actually go back and see whether you're comfortable with written math. Okay, so if you can get a head start on that or a leg up on it, it's only going to help you. Sometimes if it's a really complicated calculation, they will give you a, the answer for it, but they want to know that you got the right things. I will also say that give units, and this is another way for you to differentiate yourself. So if you say for the first line, 120 million times one times five versus 120 million households in the US, times one car per household, times five tires per car, is equal to 600 million car tires through that are on cars and owned by private individuals. If you can give those terms that the label,